Uh, my name is Sergey, uh, and I'm glad to see you at this session. Um, I work as a project manager at, at Altoros, and uh, today I'm going to share the experience uh, that our team gained uh, working on one of the projects uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, the project is about uh, building a highly available uh, cloud solution uh, for customers who operate various medical devices. And so today I'm going to focus on some specific um, uh, technical uh, aspects uh, uh, related to connecting uh, various medical devices uh, to the cloud and uh, using uh, different network protocols. Also, uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, porting the cloud solution uh, between uh, OpenStack uh, in AWS infrastructure. Okay, let's, uh, let's see about uh, the implementation requirements. I won't describe in details uh, uh, business and uh, legal requirements that initiated the project, but uh, instead I'm going to focus on uh, technical challenges and how we were able to solve them. Uh, so from the technical point of view, uh, uh, we need to build a cloud solution uh, that connects medical devices uh, uh, and users located at customer sites in a secure and reliable way. There may be thousands of devices located at each, at each customer site and uh, uh, from thousands to hundreds of uh, customers. Each customer must be provided uh, with secure and isolated connectivity to the cloud and they also need a space to store the uh, data from the device. So uh, we call uh, this solution uh, as Internet of Things uh, for healthcare uh, to some extent at least to some extent. And uh, it is planned that um, cloud implementation uh, should be portable between uh, OpenStack running on the hardware and uh, uh, public cloud provider uh, like Amazon AWS. Uh, AWS, uh, AWS is our uh, first choice of cl uh, cloud public uh, provider, but the architecture should be uh, quite generic in terms that uh, it can be uh, installed uh, or deployed on other uh, cloud, uh, public cloud uh, infrastructures. So, um, <clears throat> and even uh, when cloud is deployed on AWS, the access to the cloud should be limited uh, to only the users and customers who subscribe to the uh, service. Okay, let's talk about a bit uh, uh, high availability or HA and scalability. Uh, it is it is common to think that uh, when we have a, a cloud like AWS, cloud infrastructure like AWS, uh, scalability and um, uh, HA features are available out of the box. Uh, but it's true to only some extent because um, uh, HA, it means that uh, uh, it should be uh, supported on all layers uh, of um, uh, the solution from uh, infrastructure to the applications. Uh, of course, it includes uh, virtual machines, networks, and uh, most importantly, applications. Uh, when we talk about uh, AWS, uh, uh, probably we don't care about the physical networks, uh, uh, servers, switches, and redundant power supplies. But it's a very common case uh, when in AWS, um, uh, uh, sends the notification about the retirement of a uh, virtual machine and we need at least uh, uh, be able to migrate the virtual machine uh, without uh, uh, downtime to uh, applications and services. A uh, few words about the security. Uh, because it is a healthcare and uh, the security is a central part of the business. Uh, um, the main uh, mode to connect to the cloud is the VPN mode. Um, so there are various devices uh, in, uh, uh, located at customer sites and they operate WebSocket, TCP and HTTP protocols. And uh, what is interesting that uh, uh, old legacy HTTP devices, they have a bidirectional mode. It means that the device can send a message to the server and uh, uh, server as well uh, can send a message to the device, uh, which is uh, uh, which works well in isolated network uh, when there is a uh, direct routing between device and uh, the server. But it's challenging uh, to solve this problem uh, in the cloud. We will see a bit later uh, 
how we designed uh, the solution for HTTP devices as well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, non-VPN mode should be provided as well, at least uh, when we have a cloud in AWS and we have a public uh, endpoint uh, uh, which is protected by the list of, uh, let's say, IP addresses uh, uh, for uh, customer offices who are allowed to connect to the cloud. Uh, so there are, there, this is a kind of mixed mode to access the cloud. The VPN access uh, uh, to connect to uh, private, uh, uh, private IP address space and uh, public access. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, we talk about uh, uh, moving uh, cloud implementation between uh, uh, several infrastructures. In our case, it's uh, OpenStack and AWS. Uh, Cloud Foundry is uh, one of the best choice uh, to use as a, a platform for applications. Uh, but it's maybe challenging to configure a highly available Cloud uh, Foundry deployment, uh, uh, especially on uh, OpenStack. We'll take a look uh, closer on the next slides and, the, uh, and how Cloud Foundry components are distributed uh, on OpenStack uh, uh, virtual machines and the physical nodes. Uh, Cassandra is, uh, is the choice uh, for many projects uh, where uh, there is a need to store the data from devices because it's uh, almost unlimitedly scalable. And uh, in our case, uh, we did a lot of benchmarks with Cassandra to identify the performance of uh, a cluster uh, on, on virtual machines on OpenStack. And uh, uh, it was, uh, we, d we found that uh, it is enough to run uh, Cassandra on, on virtual machines uh, uh, to process and store uh, around um, two or three thousand uh, messages from uh, with device uh, data uh, per second. Uh, but according to data stacks, it's not a uh, good or best practice to run uh, Cassandra on uh, virtual machines. Uh, and we also evaluated additionally uh, Cassandra uh, on OpenStack uh, bare metal. Uh, OpenStack bare metal support is available uh, from OpenStack version 8 uh, uh, with the project called OpenStack uh, Ironic. Uh, for structured data, uh, we use uh, MariaDB Galera cl uh, cluster, uh, which is uh, uh, also uh, <coughs> an open source uh, project uh, uh, used um, in many solutions. Uh, uh, for example, in OpenStack, uh, the database uh, uh, that contains uh, all the configuration of OpenStack services, uh, it, is, uh, it uses uh, MariaDB cluster. Uh, we did also the benchmarks for MariaDB cluster, and uh, we found that uh, uh, <coughs> the performance of uh, uh, MariaDB is uh, uh, much uh, less in terms of uh, uh, DML operations compared to Cassandra, uh, but it's in, uh, it was enough to our use case where uh, most of operations uh, are read operations. Uh, and uh, 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 MariaDB cluster, uh, it uh, scales uh, for read operations, but it doesn't scale well for insert or, or update operations. And uh, uh, f um, in our deployment, we just tuned uh, uh, or updated uh, several configuration parameters uh, for MariaDB uh, that uh, controls uh, the behavior of uh, uh, commit uh, uh, transaction. Uh, RabbitMQ is also um, the key, uh, is all the solution that we use uh, for um, as the message queue uh, to s uh, store um, data uh, messages from devices uh, for uh, 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 subsequent uh, processing. Uh, and uh, because all the messages uh, from devices uh, they uh, hit the RabbitMQ, the performance of RabbitMQ should be uh, also uh, around uh, several thousand messages per second. Uh, in terms of being able to store message, a message in uh, a RabbitMQ and uh, to retrieve the message from the RabbitMQ. ELK stack is uh, uh, our choice for uh, storing uh, application uh, logs uh, uh, and it is integrated uh, with uh, 
uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, Kibana is the web interface, uh, probably, uh, so, uh, who uh, were on our booth uh, seen the web interface of Kibana. Uh, and um, <coughs> the Kibana web interface allows to access uh, application logs uh, in easy way to do uh, full context uh, searches. And uh, it is protected uh, by default. Uh, Kibana open source project does not have any authentication. Uh, and the way that uh, the plugin uh, that al allows to, uh, to protect uh, Kibana web interface by uh, with uh, Cloud Foundry uh, uh, authentication. And uh, it also allows to filter um, uh, the data uh, that are stored in Elasticsearch cluster uh, uh, to the data that should be visible just uh, for uh, organization and spaces in Cloud Foundry that uh, is allowed to the user uh, who, uh, uh, to, the, to the user of uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, we also found that uh, the most uh, critical uh, part of ELK stack is the log stash process, uh, which is quite slow because of the set of rules. And each rule in a log stash, it, uh, it is processed uh, sequentially. Uh, and let's say uh, if an application generates like a, a million of lines of uh, log output in the deb in debug mode, um, it uh, puts uh, uh, a big workload on uh, log stash uh, processes. So in uh, our development uh, deployment, uh, which we use as well for, for the testing, uh, we run uh, from six to 10 virtual machines uh, for log, log stash process. But it's flexible when uh, ELK deployment is managed uh, by, by Bosch. Uh, we can uh, spin up new machines uh, for the log, log stash uh, uh, dynamically. And uh, most of the uh, monitoring and alerting features uh, is uh, uh, um, provided by Zabbix. So we have a, a separate server for, for Zabbix in installation and uh, it contains a database. Uh, the database grows very fast uh, if we collect all parameters from the hardware, uh, open stack nodes, and if we collect parameters even from the Cloud Foundry uh, jobs. So let's see uh, uh, the deployment uh, diagram or deployment view for uh, our open stack. Um, when it comes to open stack, we need to choose, of course, the hardware uh, where to deploy an open stack and uh, one option is to use uh, the Blades chassis. There are a number of vendors uh, who provide Blades chassis. Uh, these are uh, HP, Dell, uh, Supermicro, at least uh, these are uh, vendors uh, that we were evaluating uh, for uh, our de development environment. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, the recommended deployment of OpenStack, it, it's uh, vendor neutral, I would say, uh, to achieve high availability of OpenStack deployment, uh, we need to use um, uh, three physical nodes, three physical nodes uh, for OpenStack management components. They are in yellow on uh, my slide. And uh, OpenStack compute services, uh, these are the services that are responsible to run virtual machines on OpenStack. Uh, uh, they are distributed across three availability zones. In our case, three availability zones, they're represented uh, by nine uh, boxes uh, in gray. And uh, each availability zone is a group of uh, physical uh, nodes or physical blades uh, in the hardware. So if we need to extend the capacity of uh, OpenStack deployment, we just add a new blade uh, uh, or new chassis with blades uh, uh, connected uh, to the networking and extend the capacity of uh, uh, our OpenStack deployment. Also in OpenStack, we have a storage uh, services. Uh, there are two major storage services. Uh, Ceph, it, it is a service that provides uh, volumes uh, for, for virtual machines. Uh, and the second one is Glance uh, that uh, uh, stores uh, virtual machine images. And uh, Swift is optional because uh, it, it uh, provides uh, OpenStack, uh, uh, it provides object storage in OpenStack. Uh, also we have uh, additional uh, services, we call them administrative services. The, uh, these are uh, the main name uh, services, um, uh, time service, and uh, mail service. 
Uh, we deploy them on uh, separate nodes and also at least uh, two machines are dedicated for these uh, services uh, to achieve uh, uh, resiliency for these services. We have, uh, we have network switches and uh, we have a, a firewall, the physical uh, hardware that, protect, that protects our cloud uh, deployment. Everything is installed in a data center. Uh, in a in, uh, in, in, uh, data center um, cabinet uh, with redundant power supplies. So let's, let's see uh, how the network uh, uh, is represented in OpenStack deployment. Uh, uh, for our uh, development uh, cloud, uh, we use uh, Cisco SA 5545 uh, hardware as uh, the cloud firewall. It supports up to mm, more than 2,000 VPN tunnels. This is a concurrent VPN tunnels. And uh, the total bandwidth of encryption traffic is about, uh, is, uh, should be uh, less than 400 megabits per second. Uh, this is the middle model of uh, Cisco uh, um, encryption hardware. Uh, and uh, if uh, we need to support more VPN tunnels and uh, more bandwidth for encryption traffic, then uh, let's say uh, we can use Cisco SA 5585. Uh, what is important is that uh, uh, it provides uh, connectivity to uh, personal user accounts uh, uh, for administrative access uh, to the cloud, and it also provides access for side-to-side uh, -side VPN connection between uh, networks. So when we uh, need to connect uh, um, a remote network to the cloud, we use side-to-side -side VPN. Uh, it also can be clustered in active standby mode, uh, which means that uh, we can achieve uh, even a, a high availability on the layer of uh, the firewall, uh, which um, the failure of uh, uh, Firewalls uh, from Cisco and uh, switches from Cisco is quite rare case, but uh, nevertheless, uh, there is an option to build uh, HA uh, uh, for um, firewall. As the networks, uh, we have an um, administrative network, uh, which, which is uh, uh, 10.30.0.0 slash 24. We just designed it in this way. Uh, it is used uh, to connect to um, management interfaces of physical nodes, to connect to a uh, switch and firewall as administrator and be able to configure remotely uh, the hardware. So no need to go to the data center. Uh, then we have a, a cloud, uh, I call it the public network. Uh, the public means that uh, this is the network which is exposed uh, from the cloud to uh, to client which connects to the cloud through the VPN. That's why we call it public. So we used it, uh, it's it's one of the example, and actually it's from one of our deployment, uh, 172.0.0 slash 24. Uh, not, not a big network, just uh, 250 uh, addresses. That's enough. Uh, also for OpenStack, uh, there are management and uh, storage networks. They're internal for OpenStack deployment. Uh, this, uh, the traffic in these networks, uh, it, it does not leave uh, an OpenStack. So it uh, uh, goes only between the nodes of OpenStack. And also we have, uh, uh, I think, about six subnets uh, for virtual machines. They are represented as the, as the last line. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I <coughs> show um, uh, the physical diagram for our network uh, and uh <coughs> the hardware. So I mentioned that we have a firewall Cisco, uh, SA5545. Uh, it, uh, um, it, uh, it has three interfaces. One is external interface, uh, which is a uh, public uh, IP address. Uh, provided by data center, for example. And then two internal interfaces. Uh, one is uh, for uh, administrative network, 10.30, and the second one is for uh, public cloud network. So uh, a firewall is our entry point to the cloud, and it also controls uh, the access between uh, these two networks, internal network, 
uh, management and uh, external network of the cloud. Then we have a switch. Uh, this is a uh, regular 48-port uh, uh, Cisco switch. It has just um, uh, the management um, uh, uh, address in the management network, um, uh, and uh, it also um, uh, conf uh, we configure also all virtual LANs on uh, the switch to be able to communicate, uh, to provide communication between OpenStack nodes and between uh, the virtual uh, machines. And uh, we have uh, with the um, chassis, uh, uh, super micro chassis uh, 16 blades, we have uh, three uh, nodes for uh, OpenStack uh, management services. Uh, actually, in OpenStack, uh, the role of these nodes is called uh, controller. And uh, we have uh, 11 nodes uh, for uh, OpenStack compute and storage services. Um, um, in uh, some recommended practices for OpenStack deployment, uh, the uh, storage uh, nodes, they are separated from compute nodes. But in our case, to save uh, uh, the budget uh, for development uh, deployment uh, and just to evaluate if it works, uh, we uh, use uh, um, uh, OpenStack compute nodes uh, as well for the storage. Uh, in each node we have just uh, two hard drives. One is uh, uh, configured as the uh, drive for the base system of OpenStack, and the second drive is, is, is used uh, specifically for uh, storage service of OpenStack. And also we have two uh, physical nodes uh, for administrative uh, services. Uh, and the interesting point is they are on the left uh, side. And the interesting point is that for to uh, uh, run uh, these uh, nodes, we use uh, uh, ESXi, VMware, VMware ESXi, uh, free licensed uh, hypervisor. Uh, so uh, uh, hyper, uh, ES, ESXi hypervisor can be used uh, uh, in free until you have uh, two CPUs on the uh, hardware node and uh, probably without limitation by memory. So almost uh, all the nodes then the same in configuration, uh, 128 gigabytes of memory and one CPU with eight cores. Uh, so. Uh, once again, uh, in our case, uh, firewall, it controls the access to from outside world to the cloud. It also controls access uh, how any service or virtual machine can access uh, uh, the internet as well. Uh, so um, um, in our case, uh, we just allow to access uh, uh, NTP services outside of the cabinet and uh, probably the mail service also should have uh, access to the internet. That's all. Um, sure. Uh, on VMware, we have several virtual machines. Uh, one virtual machine uh, is used uh, for OpenStack deployment tool. Uh, in our deployment, we use uh, Mirantis OpenStack, and it has an op uh, a fuel uh, project or fuel tool uh, that uh, uh, is a uh, uh, GUI-based uh, tool to deploy OpenStack and to manage OpenStack. So we spin up uh, an OpenStack. Yes, the answer is we spin up an OpenStack from ESXi node. And then we run uh, uh, virtual machines for DNS, NTP, and SMTP services as well in ASXI. Okay, let's let's see uh, distribution of um, Cloud Foundry components and uh, our uh, backend services uh, by uh, OpenStack availability zones. As I already mentioned, we, uh, to be uh, uh, HA highly available on the level of uh, uh, services on top of an infrastructure, uh, we agreed to have at least uh, three availability zones. These three availability zones, they are a group of physical nodes on the chassis, in, 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 in Blade's chassis. And uh, if we distribute uh, Cloud Foundry jobs uh, in this availability zone, in three availability zones, then we may uh, presume that we will have uh, uh, 
HA uh, on the hardware level, on the platform level, and then we have think about the HA on the application tier. Uh, so in Cloud Foundry, um, almost all components, uh, they can be deployed uh, uh, with at least two or three instances. Perhaps the three zones, that's working fine from my perspective, but your administrative nodes one mm -hmm. uh, that's not a problem because our administrative nodes they, these are two also two physical nodes two physical nodes and uh, virtual machines for uh, for example for um, uh, a DNS server we use uh, open uh, uh, open source Linux tool bind called bind uh, it has master slave configuration and it allows to uh, uh, put the DNS records in one master server and then they are replicated to the slave server. For some services, we agreed that uh, we cannot achieve uh, configuration with two or three instances or virtual machine. And for example, in Cloud Foundry, um, these are database uh, that contains uh, all user records, all application, all application states. And uh, when we test it, if we lose the database, uh, uh, we cannot uh, push an application in Cloud Foundry, but we can access application. That's okay. That's okay. So uh, for Cloud Foundry, uh, we deploy um, application con um, virtual machines for application containers in all three zones. Uh, uh, in our test, we identified that uh, f to support uh, uh, from uh, about uh, uh, 50,000 uh, concurrent connections from the devices, which are emulated, of course. Uh, we need around uh, uh, six, um, um, six VMs for application containers, and each VM is uh, uh, 64 gigabytes of memory and, about, and as far as I remember, uh, 16 uh, virtual CPUs. That's okay. And uh, another important uh, component that should be made as HA uh, is a router, because it uh, has a routing table uh, for all applications. It, it also uh, maintains all connections uh, between uh, uh, external client and uh, an application. In the case of the device, uh, WebSocket devices, they establish persistent connection. And this persistent connection, they consume, of course, memory, CPU, so uh, the routers should be uh, also adjusted. Uh, we apply the same principle of uh, three availability zones to Cassandra, MariaDB, and RabbitMQ. That works well, um, um, uh, except of that uh, for Cassandra, we can extend uh, the cluster uh, uh, combining uh, virtual nodes into RECs. This is a, a terminology from, from Cassandra REC. Uh, so uh, in our um, test deployment, we have, uh, I think, six nodes of, of Cassandra cluster, two nodes in each availability zone. Okay, let's see uh, what is uh, outside of the cloud. Uh, I call this cloud resources. Uh, Mm, so we have a VPN endpoint, which is our entry into the cloud. And uh, we have a domain name, uh, because this is a private cloud on the hardware, on a data center, and it can be accessed only uh, through the VPN connection. Uh, we, de we decided to use a um, private uh, domain name. Uh, for, for simplicity, I called it, uh, and uh, uh, it... it um, it's like a pattern in our real deployment. Uh, Cloud1.cloudprovider.corp. So uh, the corp, it means that it is a private cloud and it's this, uh, uh, the main name is not resolved outside of our uh, connection to the cloud. We have two DNS servers for HA mode. Uh, we also have uh, NTP service, uh, servers uh, that uh, are optional to expose uh, to clients. And uh, we have Cloud Foundry uh, API endpoint. Actually, for the customer uh, who connects to the cloud, they don't need access to an API 
of Cloud Foundry. They need to, to work with applications that are published in Cloud Foundry. But because uh, when you access an application, you hit uh, uh, the endpoint of Cloud Foundry, uh, these are two addresses that I used to connect to Cloud Foundry API, and these are two endpoints uh, uh, to connect to an application, uh, which is published in Cloud Foundry. Actually, uh, it can be more than two. In, uh, at least we have uh, to publish two endpoints and to have two endpoints. And as I uh, already mentioned, uh, uh, there are two major, uh, two main types of VPN connection. Uh, one is called, uh, uh, one is provided by any connect VPN adapter. This is a um, small software which is installed um, on the computer when you connect uh, to the VPN endpoint of Cisco. And, and it is installed uh, automatically uh, for, uh, it is available and the VPN adapter is available for Linux, Mac and Windows. So no manual configuration. We just uh, go to the uh, uh, VPN endpoint in the browser and it downloads uh, Cisco AnyConnect VPN adapter. And for the network, uh, we uh, set up site-to-site -site VPN connection which is uh, uh, the well-defined process. Uh, so um, uh, uh, with the remote networks, uh, we exchange uh, with VPN template that defines uh, all uh, uh, VPN connection parameters. Uh, and then uh, we uh, exchange uh, 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 with security password that uh, is used uh, to establish VPN connection. For every VPN connection, the recommended practice is to use uh, the password of less, at least of 20 uh, characters. So it's two-step uh, process. Exchange the template and then uh, configure uh, the firewalls on both sides, uh, exchange the password and uh, the VPN tunnel is established. Uh, let's see what we have uh, uh, from the network perspective when we have VPN connections. Uh, on this slide, uh, uh, these two VPN types are represented. Uh, the, um, are, uh, the purple uh, circle on the left side, it is a uh, Cisco uh, AnyConnect administrative VPN connection. Uh, uh, for this connection, uh, we expose from the cloud uh, completely two networks, the public network and uh, uh, internal administrative network. So it allows uh, uh, using this uh, network connection to manage uh, uh, all the physical hardware in the cloud and it allows to manage virtual machines, it allows to manage OpenStack, so uh, do any kind of uh, administrative uh, actions. And uh, for the customer uh, VPN connections, uh, there are two um, uh, situations. The first one is when the customer network does not overlap with uh, our cloud network. And uh, uh, the second one is when the customer network can potentially overlap with the uh, cloud network. In the, in, uh, uh, in the example uh, on this slide, the customer one uh, has an internal network, uh, 172.30, which uh, overlaps with our cloud network. That's the problem when you try to access any uh, uh, resource uh, in the cloud using the same network address, which is inside uh, uh, our inside customer private network. Uh, to solve this problem, uh, there is a technology which is called uh, network address translation. Uh, it is defined by the RFC, special RFC, uh, and uh, the range of this network uh, is uh, defined by 100.64.0.0 and mask uh, and network mask, uh, yeah, probably it's 10. So it's a, it is a range of uh, 4 million addresses. So we can translate the address uh, from the cloud using this uh, technology, and it will be represented to the customer as an address from uh, this special network uh, address range. So in our case, for the customer one, um, uh, we, uh, re we translate addresses from uh, the cloud. Uh, these are uh, Cloud Foundry endpoints and uh, DNS servers. We translate using these addresses using uh, the special network range. 
So let's see uh, how it looks, uh, the representing of network addresses to uh, three major types of our uh, connection, VPN connections. Uh, for any connect, we expose uh, from the cloud uh, two networks completely. So we can manage uh, the hardware, we can manage OpenStack, we can manage virtual machines. And uh, uh, when we connect uh, using the VPN adapter, this can you connect VPN adapter, uh, it establishes uh, uh, an automated way access to DNS servers uh, and uh, cloud finder endpoints. So all uh, the main name resolution, it goes through the cloud in the case of uh, CISCANY Connect. Uh, for side-to-side -side VPN connections, we publish uh, on, the cl on Cloud Firewall, we publish only endpoints uh, for uh, DNS and for Cloud Foundry. Just in our case, uh, it's just four addresses, four addresses. Uh, if the VPN uh, connection without uh, address translation, then we have original addresses, 172.7, and the last, the last number in the network address, it represents the real address of a server in the cloud. And with side-to-side uh, uh, -side VPN, uh, uh, with address translation, we translate these addresses to 100.64. Uh, and the last number is the same in, uh, in addresses. And it's easy to, for us to remember and to understand what we expose from the cloud, even with, uh, with not. Uh, uh, one just uh, additional comment that uh, there are clients uh, who requires to set additional address trans translation on top of these addresses inside their network. So uh, the user inside the um, uh, corporate network doesn't know the origination of uh, cloud address. This is a double. Uh, uh, address translation process. It works with Cisco uh, perfectly. Uh, so let's see uh, how to resolve uh, the main names uh, in the case of uh, VPN connection. There are two approaches, and uh, one is to uh, set up the process which is called uh, DNS zone forwarding. Uh, it can be configured uh, uh, on customer uh, DNS server and uh, uh, it defines that uh, uh, all requests to the zone um, a wildcard dot cloud want dot dot cloud provider dot corp it sh they should be forwarded to uh, our cloud DNS servers and uh, there are two cases there are two cases if we have a, a connection without network address translation and if we have connection with network address translation. The configuration on customer side will be different. Uh, but for some customers, it turned out that uh, they don't want to uh, do any changes uh, inside a DNS uh, policy. For that case, uh, we decided to use uh, public domain name. Uh, let's, say our, uh, let's say the cloud provider, I mean, uh, uh, the customer, of, uh, not the customer, but the owner of, the, uh, of this healthcare cloud, it uh, has a domain name, cloudprovider.com. And uh, for that, uh, um, uh, to be able to designate that it's a cloud one, we create a record uh, VPN dash uh, um, cloud one. And uh, the addresses are private addresses. So the uh, resolution process is served by uh, um, uh, public uh, domain uh, name uh, server, for example, Route 53, but, but addresses are private. And uh, finally, to work with applications, uh, 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 when we have two, domain, uh, two domains, uh, at least uh, in Cloud Foundry, we'll have a main domain. In our case, is uh, cf.cloud1.cloudprovider.corp uh, 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 and we also add a domain for public uh, domain, uh, for public uh, resolution process. Uh, all these domains, they are shared in terms that can be used uh, by applications published in different organization or spaces. And the final step to access, uh, to be able to provide access to an application uh, with two domains, uh, we need to uh, add 
uh, a route uh, for uh, public domain uh, name record. And uh, in the last part of presentation, uh, I would like to describe briefly um, the problem of uh, uh, connectivity uh, for various device types. So, uh, uh, in our case, uh, we, uh, had to, we have to provide connectivity for TCP devices, uh, which establish uh, persistent TCP connections uh, for WebSocket devices. Uh, they also um, establish persistent connection at uh, some point of time. And also we have uh, legacy devices that operates uh, uh, bidirectional HTTP mode. Uh, I'm, I mean that device can send a message to the cloud and an application uh, in the cloud also uh, should initiate a message to the device. And uh, when we have two customer networks, uh, very likely that they will uh, have the same uh, network range. Let's say 192, 168. Uh, uh, and uh, um, the routing from uh, the cloud, uh, from the uh, customer network to the cloud, uh, it is transparent and it is supported by um, uh, Cisco uh, hardware. That's no problem. But uh, the routing from the cloud to the customer network is, is quite complex. Uh, and in case if uh, uh, network ranges uh, uh, over, uh, overlap between uh, remote networks, in that case, um, we have um, to design uh, a way uh, uh, to, uh, so the pair of device and uh, uh, service in the cloud will be unique. And uh, 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 we identified that uh, we, can do is, we can do this uh, uh, creating a s uh, proxy services uh, in the cloud. And they map on this picture uh, by the color. So from customer one network, we have device in the red color. And uh, in, the, in uh, our open cloud, opens, opens, open stack cloud, we also have a proxy server uh, uh, with, with the red co color. Uh, and uh, for one uh, remote network, uh, there is enough to have just one proxy server. For the customer uh, two network, uh, we have a blue uh, box uh, with the proxy server for this customer network. And it works. So it will work because the uh, pair of uh, uh, addresses of device, uh, proxy server, and VPN connection is unique uh, uh, for all connections. Uh, and uh, this is a quite easy implementation, and it works on standard IP with uh, version 4 protocol. Uh, we uh, evaluated uh, to um, uh, solve this problem, we evaluated uh, uh, some uh, expensive solution like uh, Cisco application uh, centric infrastructure, but it turned out that uh, they, didn't, uh, they don't work as we expect. And uh, as, as an implementation for proxy server, we use uh, open source engines. Uh, it can run on OpenStack, it can run on uh, uh, VMware ESXi. So in our case, to provide uh, HA, uh, we started uh, inside an OpenStack. Uh, and the last set of uh, um, comments uh, is about uh, uh, migrating the platform to AWS. So uh, our first platform was an OpenStack, uh, but then we had to migrate uh, to AWS. Uh, so in AWS, uh, uh, the architecture is pretty similar. The, uh, we use uh, Virtual Private Cloud in AWS, and uh, for Virtual Private Cloud, we uh, right from the start we uh, um, decided to use uh, a network uh, which does which will not have an intersection with customer networks. This is a 100. In our case, in this is a, this example from real deployment in AWS, we use 100.64 uh, as the network. Uh, and uh, it contains Cloud Foundry, all our backend services, and it also contains a proxy uh, for uh, old legacy HTTP devices. Uh, and uh, for uh, proxy servers, uh, we just uh, um, <clears throat> allocate a subnet within a VPC network 
uh, and uh, as the VPN, uh, as the VPN, uh, we used a Cisco SA virtual uh, firewall uh, because uh, we found that we uh, uh, AWS uh, VPN gateway that is a, a standard way to connect uh, to cloud. Um, uh, based on the uh, AWS uh, recommendation, uh, it does not uh, uh, fit to all parameters, uh, uh, um, does not match all parameters required for the VPN connection. That's why we uh, decided to use Cisco SA uh, virtual uh, firewall. Uh, um, as the comment uh, for Cisco SA virtual uh, firewall, uh, I would like to mention that the price is quite high. It's about uh, $2 per hour, uh, which uh, um, uh, turns into almost the same price uh, during the year as uh, the hardware unit. So um, uh, this proved that uh, our architecture can be, uh, can be ported between uh, uh, OpenStack and AWS and it's a uh, um, fairly uh, infrastructure agnostic architecture. Uh, there are a lot of other changes uh, that we solved during the project, uh, which of course uh, it's, uh, I, I would not be able to explain uh, during the short time, but I will be glad to answer your questions uh, after the session or right now. Uh, that's all that I would like to share. Thank you very much. Any questions?